Okay, welcome. We're now into our next discussion regarding the court system. And again, this narrative of these PowerPoints uh, are sourced from our textbook readings and your handouts. The uh, federal government and the state government parallel one another. In both the federal and state governments, each of the three branches of government, and that's established by the Constitution, are legislative, executive, and judicial. And they act as a restraint on the others because of the powers of the government are divided among them. And this concept is called separation of powers. Separation of powers. You should have a good understanding in your textbook reading about the uh, reference of separation of powers. Federal courts can decide federal questions involving the application of the Constitution or federal statutes. For example, federal courts have the jurisdiction to decide federal civil rights laws, such as the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act of 1967. A state court would not have the jurisdiction or the so-called power to decide such federal questions. Now let's talk about the term judges and justices. A judge presides over a court. And there's different levels of the court system, which we'll talk about in just a moment. A justice would preside over the appellate and Supreme Court levels of courts. Judges are typically in the state trial courts or federal trial courts, and justices would be judges, but they're referred to as justices that serve in an appellate capacity, and that would be in the state court system, the uh, uh, appellate courts, or in the federal court system, the courts of appeal. So note the difference. There is a section in your textbook that also reflects these distinctions. Let's talk about our court system. And again, there's a handout that I've asked you to look at. And we'll look at the Illinois state court system. Uh, state court systems have the same basic structure as the federal court system has. Uh, they have trial courts and appellate courts. And many state systems include courts of specialized jurisdiction, such as domestic relations courts or small claim courts. As with both state and federal courts, the dispute is first raised at the trial court level. And in Illinois, we call the trial court level the circuit courts. That's where the party litigants bring their cases for adjudication. And when I use the term adjudication, that means a decision upon which the dispute is based and the process that is applied. There may be various levels of courts within the circuit court system here, depending upon the the venue, when I say venue, Cook County, for example, McHenry County, each circuit court has the authority to um, compose different areas within their, their court system uh, for application of this adjudication process. Uh, here's a little trivia note for you. Uh, in in uh, Cook County, uh, the Cook County Courts, as I should say, has the most court systems amongst any other court system in the United States and in the world and in the world. In other words, there are more court systems and divisions of courts in Cook County circuit courts than in any other court system throughout the United States. Just a bit of, tor uh, of trivia for you. Let's talk about uh, at the trial court level how disputes are presented. Uh, at the trial court level, disputes of fact, fact, are presented before either the judge or the jury to decide the outcome. 
rules of law, which is a concept that we've talked about last, which involves legal precedents, are applied to the facts in arriving at an outcome, decision, or verdict. Now, each party has the right to appeal the adverse decision or verdict to an appellate court within the appropriate jurisdiction. So after there's been a decision at the trial court level in the state system that we're looking at, the party that uh, believes that the application of the rule of law was improperly made or uh, an interpretation of the law that could have affected the outcome of the uh, decision or the verdict has a right to appeal to the appellate court. Now, the appellate court does not retry the case. It doesn't convene the parties together and all the witnesses. Instead, what the appellate court will do is review what the trial court did below, so to speak, and to determine whether errors of law were made based on interpretation of the rules of law such that those errors may have affected the outcome the outcome of the uh, case. Once the decision is made at the appellate court, the parties may appeal to the circuit, I'm sorry, the Supreme Court. However, the right of appeal is not automatic, it's limited, and the Supreme Court will accept very, very few appellate court cases to review. Whereas, once a trial court decision has been made, and the time for all arguments post the uh, verdict or post the decision has taken place, then there can be a timely appeal to the appellate court by way of right. There's not an automatic way of right to get to the Supreme Court. There has to be a petition to the Supreme Court so that the Supreme Court, if interested, may choose, may choose to hear that dispute. It's important to note that the appellate courts in both state and federal court systems decide questions of law. And again, just to emphasize, they are not empowered to decide questions of fact. Questions of fact are decided upon by a judge sitting without the, the jury or a jury that's been composed to render a decision based on the rules of law that the court instructs. You've heard the term jury instructions, maybe? Well, jury instructions are the rules of law that a judge will instruct the jury to apply in deciding the facts. In other words, factual disputes are resolved by the trier of fact the judge or the jury at the trial court level. The appellate courts decide whether legal mistakes in applying the law occurred at the lower court so as to require a different outcome. And those different outcomes can be reversal, remand, or otherwise. And appeals which reach the Supreme Court of a state, as I mentioned earlier, are not automatic. And the various respective state Supreme Courts must decide first whether to accept the appeal from the appellate court. And very few appeals from appellate court decisions are accepted by state Supreme Courts. Appeals to the respective state courts are not a matter of right, as are appeals from the state courts to the appellate courts within the so-called governing jurisdiction. Now let's talk about the federal court system. Uh, within the federal judicial system, appeals to the United States Supreme Court are available in two ways. In the first, an appellant has an appeal of right. An appeal of right most often arises when a U.S. Court of Appeals has held a state constitution or a state statute, I should say, unconstitutional, or a state court has found a state statute valid in a case where a party has claimed that the state violated the U.S. Constitution. Here's a little bit of trivia for you. The state Supreme Court decides more than 90% of the appeals of this type without formal hearing. 
The second way, and this is the most prevalent way that appeals reach the United States Supreme Court, is by means of an appellant's application for a writ of certiorari, which is an order of a lower court to send the Supreme Court the record of the case for its review. I'm using different terms here. Uh, you'll need to understand what these terms are. As I've reminded you in the last discussion, when you hear these terms, if you don't understand what they mean, use your textbook and the glossary in your textbook to help define those terms, understand their meaning, so that you can then apply them to the context. The, with regard to the writ of certiorari, the court may grant the writ when a case presents an issue which another U.S. Court of Appeals has decided differently. And in other words, the Supreme Court wants to decide that decision once and for all, at least within that line of precedent. And also the validity of whether a federal statute is in question or a party in a state Supreme Court asserts a right under the U.S. Constitution. The Supreme Court has complete discretion as to whether to grant a so-called writ of certiorari. Very, very few cases ever reach the United States Supreme Court. Let's talk about another concept that is very important in our study, and that's the concept of the power of judicial review. The power of judicial review. You're going to need to understand that concept and also the case upon which it originates. In the United States, the most significant power of the courts or the judiciary is judicial review, which means that the power to review the laws passed by the legislative body and to declare them to be unconstitutional and void. In other words, and I want to make sure that this is well understood, the United States Supreme Court has the authority to review laws passed by a legislative body and to declare them unconstitutional and void. That's called the power of judicial review. I also want to introduce a topic that's in your textbook involving the court system and this topic involves two competing, competing theories, if you will, regarding judicial decision-making. One theory would be viewed as judicial restraint versus another theory of judicial decision-making decision uh, called judicial activism. And your authors actually go into some detail in providing you some context, information, and background regarding these two theories. And I want to turn your attention to, um, let me go back, I want to turn your attention to what's in your textbook, yeah, where, where it indicates that in practice, the U.S. Supreme Court rarely exercises its extraordinary powers and has developed carefully crafted rules as self-imposed limits on its authority as individual jurist. As individual jurists exercise the power of judicial review, they do so with varying political attitudes and philosophies. Some judges believe that judicial power should be used very sparingly. And I'm reading from your textbook source on this. Others are willing to use it more often. Those who believe that the power should not be used except in unusual cases are said to believe in judicial restraint. Those who think that judicial decision-making should be used whenever the needs of society justify its use believe in so-called judicial activism. Well, these are concepts that need to be understood because they're part of our legal system. They're part of the legal environment of business. From a very practical, very practical sense, as your authors uh, so describe. 
And the power for judicial review and the power for judicial decision making, especially with respect to acts of Congress, originates from the case of Marbury versus Madison. Marbury versus Madison. And a quick reference to that case is also contained in your textbook. I am going to be issuing here this week an opportunity for you to gain some extra credit points by examining the case of Marbury versus Madison in more detail. I'm going to offer an extra credit opportunity up to 20 points if you write about the case of Marbury versus Madison. You can limit it to two pages, two typed pages or two written pages if you'd like and you can email those to me but I would like you to examine if you choose the case of Marbury versus Madison, its history and its impact in our legal system even today. So that's an extra credit opportunity We're 20 points. I'm going to send you an email to that effect in short order, but I would advise and I certainly would recommend that you uh, take advantage of the extra credit opportunities that I will present throughout this course. But do look into these concepts of restraint and activism in judicial decision making because it's part of our legal environment of business, at least from perspectives. And uh, we're using this textbook, which is in its uh, 17th or 18th edition. And uh, these concepts have been raised in many prior editions in which I've also taught from. And I think it's interesting and something that you as students should have exposure to. Exposure to. All right, hopefully uh, you'll go through the court system chapter with care and attention. There's a lot of rules and information and background for you to evaluate. And again, these early chapters in this textbook are designed to give you a foundation and an overview of our legal environment of business and a better understanding of how some of these substantive laws are applied in, in court decisions. And of course, court decisions guide, guide a business decision making along the way. So uh, hopefully this session has been informative and will give you some additional uh, insight into what we've been studying. Uh, thank you.